LibriVox.org. Narrative of the Life of Frederick Douglass. Written by Frederick Douglass. Chapter 5. As to my own treatment while I lived on Colonel Lloyd's plantation, it was very similar to that of the other slave children. I was not old enough to work in the field, and there being little else than field work to do, I had a great deal of leisure time. The most I had to do was to drive up the cows at evening, keep the fowls out of the garden, keep the front yard clean, and run of errands for my old master's daughter, Mrs. Lucretia Ald. The most of my leisure time I spent in helping Master Daniel Lloyd in finding his birds after he had shot them. My connection with Master Daniel was of some advantage to me. He became quite attached to me, and was a sort of protector of me. He would not allow the older boys to impose upon me, and would divide his cakes with me. I was seldom whipped by my old master, and suffered little from anything else than hunger and cold. I suffered much from hunger, but much more from cold. In hottest summer and coldest winter I was kept almost naked. No shoes, no stockings, no jacket, no trousers, nothing on but a coarse towel linen shirt, reaching only to my knees. I had no bed. I must have perished with cold, but that, the coldest nights, I used to steal a bag which was used for carrying corn to the mill. I would crawl into this bag, and there sleep on the cold, damp clay floor, with my head in and feet out. My feet have been so cracked with the frost that the pen with which I am writing might be laid in the gashes. We were not regularly allowance. Our food was coarse corn meal boiled. This was called mush. It was put into a large wooden tray or trowel and set down upon the ground. The children were then called like so many pigs, and like so many pigs they would come and devour the mush. Some with oyster shells, others with pieces of shingle, some with naked hands, and none with spoons. He that ate fastest got most. He that was strongest secured the best place, and few left the trough satisfied. I was probably between seven and eight years old when I left Colonel Lloyd's plantation. I left it with joy. I shall never forget the ecstasy with which I received the intelligence that my old master, Anthony, had determined to let me go to Baltimore to live with Mr. Hugh Ald, brother to my old master's son-in-law, Captain Thomas Ald. I received this information about three days before my departure. They were three of the happiest days I ever enjoyed. I spent the most part of all these three days in the creek, washing off the plantation's girth, and preparing myself for my departure. The pride of appearance which this would indicate was not my own. I spent the time in washing, not so much because I wished to, but because Mrs. Lucretia had told me I must get all of the dead skin off of my feet and knees before I could go to Baltimore, for the people in Baltimore were very cleanly and would laugh at me if I looked dirty. Besides, she was going to give me a pair of trousers, which I should not put on unless I got all the dirt off me. The thought of owning a pair of trousers was great indeed. It was almost a sufficient motive not only to make me take off what would be called by pig drovers the mange, but the skin itself. I went at it in good earnest, working for the first time with the hope of reward. The ties that ordinarily bind children to their homes were all suspended in my case. I found no severe trial in my departure. My home was charmless. It was not home to me. On departing from it, I could not feel that I was leaving anything which I could have enjoyed by staying. My mother was dead. My grandmother lived far off, so that I seldom saw her. I had two sisters and one brother that lived in the same house with me, but the early separation of us from our mother had well nigh blotted the fact of our relationship from our memories. I looked for home elsewhere, and was confident of finding none which I should relish less than the one which I was leaving. If, however, I made in my new home hardship, hunger, whipping, and nakedness, I had the consolation that I should not have escaped any one of them by staying. Having already had more than a taste of them in the house of my old master, and having endured them there, I very naturally inferred my ability to endure them elsewhere, and especially at Baltimore, for I had something of the feeling about Baltimore that is expressed in the proverb, that being hanged in England is preferable to dying a natural death in Ireland. 
I had the strongest desire to see Baltimore. Cousin Tom, though not fluent in speech, had inspired me with that desire by his eloquent description of the place. I could never point out anything at the great house, no matter how beautiful or powerful, but that he had seen something at Baltimore far exceeding, both in beauty and strength, the object which I pointed out to him. Even the great house itself, with all its pictures, was far inferior to many buildings in Baltimore. So strong was my desire that I thought a gratification of it would fully compensate for whatever loss of comforts I should sustain by the exchange. I left without a regret, and with the highest hopes of future happiness. We sailed out of Miles River for Baltimore on a Saturday morning. I remember only the day of the week, for at that time I had no knowledge of the days of the month, nor the months of the year. On setting sail I walked oft, and gave to Colonel Lloyd's plantation what I hoped would be the last look. I then placed myself in the bows of the sloop, and there spent the remainder of the day in looking ahead, interesting myself in what was in the distance rather than in the things nearby or behind. In the afternoon of that day we reached Annapolis, the capital of the state. We stopped but a few moments, so that I had no time to go on shore. It was the first large town that I had ever seen, and though it would look small compared with some of our New England factory villages, I thought it was a wonderful place for its size, more imposing even than the great house farm. We arrived at Baltimore early on Sunday morning, landing at Smith's Wharf, not far from Bowley's Wharf. We had on board the sloop a large flock of sheep, and after aiding and driving them to the slaughterhouse of Mr. Curtis on Luden Slater's Hill, I was conducted by Rich, one of the hands belonging on board of the sloop, to my new home in Aliciana Street, near Mr. Garden's shipyard on Fells Point. Mr. and Mrs. Ald were both at home, and met me at the door with their little son Thomas, to take care of whom I had been given. And here I saw what I had never seen before. It was a white face beaming with the most kindly emotions. It was the face of my new mistress, Sophia Ald. I wish I could describe the rapture that flashed through my soul as I beheld it. It was a new and strange sight to me, brightening up my pathway with the light of happiness. Little Thomas was told there was his Freddy. I was told to take care of little Thomas, and thus I entered upon the duties of my new home with the most cheering prospect ahead. I looked upon my departure from Colonel Lloyd's plantation as one of the most interesting events of my life. It is possible, and even quite probable, that but for the mere circumstance of being removed from that plantation to Baltimore, I should have to-day, instead of being here seated by my own table, in the enjoyment of freedom and the happiness of home, writing this narrative, been confined in the growling chains of slavery. Going to live at Baltimore laid the foundation, and opened the gateway, to all my subsequent prosperity. I have ever regarded it as the first plain manifestation of that kind of providence which has ever since attended me, and marked my life with so many favors. I regarded the selection of myself as being somewhat remarkable. There were a number of slave children that might have been sent from the plantation to Baltimore. There were those younger, those older, and those of the same age. I was chosen from among them all, and was the first, last, and only choice. I may be deemed superstitious and even egotistical in regarding this event as a special interposition of divine providence in my favor, but I should be false to the earliest sentiments of my soul if I suppress the opinion. I prefer to be true to myself, even at the hazard of incurring the ridicule of others, rather than to be false and incur my own abhorrence. From my earliest recollection, I date the entertainment of a deep conviction that slavery would not always be able to hold me within its foul embrace, and in the darkest hours of my career in slavery, this living word of faith and spirit of hope departed not from me, but remained like ministering angels to cheer me through the gloom. This good spirit was from God, and to him I offer thanksgiving and praise. End of chapter 5 this recording by Jeanette Ferguson on June 7, 2007.